Hey everyone and welcome to Career Stories Live. I am Carrie Twig and I have a guest today. Uh, Matthew Purdy is going to be on in just a minute. Um, today's show is all about job seeking and being a job seeker when you are a newcomer. We're going to speak specifically to being a newcomer in Canada because that's where our experience is. I think there's lots of things that you can gleam if you're not a newcomer, <laughs> because um, not like sometimes when I'm teaching people who are new to Canada or telling them about job search or, or resumes, having that conversation, um, they might have a friend with them who's like, I've lived in this country like 30 years and I didn't know this stuff. So a lot of times not everybody knows it. And so to be new to a country, trying to make a mark, trying to make a living um, and get known and navigating a system that most people who lived here, I certainly didn't know this. Like uh, if you had asked me eight years ago, how, like what a resume looks like, how to write a really good one, I wouldn't have known the answer. So we're going to share all that we know today about landing work in Canada, about navigating it, what a resume should look like, some tips that we have on get you know if you have to have that Canadian work experience and you don't have it yet uh, we're going to cover some stuff on LinkedIn we're going to take your questions and so I'm really excited to um yeah to to get going but would love your questions just put them into the um um the chat any questions that you have and we will we will get on to them so I'm going to get Matthew live on here with me hey there how are you Pretty good, pretty good. How about you? Good, good. I can hear you. I can see you. Life is good. <laughs> yeah, always nice when the tech works, isn't it? <laughs> that's like, that's totally half of it. Um, now, you are a facilitator, no, career coach, facilitator, and speaker. Yeah, I wear a bunch of hats, uh, sort of in the career development world. Um, so yeah, do uh, do programming, do coaching, do facilitating, do speaking, just trying to help people get back to work. And so uh, it's something I dove into over the last seven years, and uh, it's been good to me. So I'm just happy to pay back a little bit. Yeah. Do you, are you, um, how did you get into this? I'm interested in how. Oh, <laughs> now that's a story. <laughs> Um, it's funny because we've talked tons and yeah, it's funny. It was funny to hear people's backstories about how they get into the field and such. But uh, so going way back, like I was that guy in in high school who, you know, um, thought he had it all figured out, uh, got got good grades, like did what the teachers and the, the, the adults, you know, were expecting. Um, but I, I was completely lost when it came to like job search or career options. Um, now, I don't, I'm not too hard on myself. I mean, high school, you're not, not supposed to have it all figured out. But uh, I, I didn't know what, know what to do. And so I did what any good student does, goes to university, right? Because they're, they're going to help you figure it out. Yeah. Um, so after a year of that, I was like, this isn't helping. I'm still completely lost. Um, so I just booked it. I said, I'm out of here. Um, I'm going to go travel the world and figure this out. So I bought a one-way ticket to Southeast Asia. Um, lived there wow. for, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry, it's That's coming around. Fun. It's coming around. Um, and so, yeah, I did a whole bunch of working and exploring and figuring it out for myself. Uh, and then it slowly became more more work and less holiday. Um, and then as I, as I sort of grew up and got married and stuff, life got to get pretty serious and we moved back here. And like I had 10 years of work experience. I spent 10 years abroad um, and was treated like a newcomer when I got back. I faced all the same challenges. Okay. Um, Wild. And yeah, yeah. So that's what got me into it. And uh, lucky, like I, I seriously had to pull every string in my network. Um, but anyways, ended up getting a job offer to be a career coach, leveraged the international experience. And seven years later, here we are. I that's a remarkable story. That's that's a okay, that's wild. <laughs> There's um, lots to unpack there, yeah. Yeah, so I have something to unpack. I'm wondering, is there I'm hearing like a squeaky sound? Do you think the squeaky is from me? It might be or, my, if my mic is maybe rubbing on my shirt. Is that uh, mm, better now? Yeah, it's like well, it's a weird hollow. And oh. I just like oh, yeah, I don't know what it is, but okay. Do you think I need the headphones in? They work better, right? Um, uh, sorry, what, Dave? Seems pretty minor. Yeah. Okay, Dave, since it's minor, I'm just sensitive. Okay. <laughs> 
okay. Um, what were, so in those 10 years that you were mm -hmm. working, what did you do? I uh, taught English um, okay. at private schools, international schools. Um, it was really just paying for my vacation. Um, okay. But but yeah, eventually it, it became more serious. Um, but yeah, when I got back, it was, you know, all I had all this foreign experience and, and people looked, looked over me. Um, right. I spent a year getting back on my feet, um, working part-time jobs, contract positions, rebuilding my network. It had completely dried up. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. And so... So all the places on your resume would have been like international. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I was primarily working out of Indonesia, um, uh, but it traveled lots. But uh, yeah, it just, it wasn't like it was, it was in Jakarta. Like, where's this? Where, what do they do? And, and Right. And yeah. then not, and then did you find it wasn't respected? I found that I wasn't getting any traction. Um, okay. Like it was just so easy to be passed over. And the, you know, the experiences that I did have, oh, the, add to that, like I had no idea how, what I was doing in terms of writing resumes or cover letters. And okay. so I did the online classes and the freebies, but they weren't helping. And yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we already have a whole bunch of questions <laughs> coming in for people. <laughs> but I think that first one is I would love to talk to you about um, resume, like newcomer resumes. And I think for anyone watching, if they're like, how can Carrie even speak to <laughs> working with newcomers? I, d I would say a very, a very small part of my business is people who are newcomers to Canada but the people who come all come to me after they've been to the free programs. Mm. So they go to the free government programs and I know you have taught in them and sometimes mm -hmm. teach and support. So I don't, I'm not like slamming them. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to kind of talk about the difference like sure. of what you might get caught taught in one of those programs or a free program or the federal program. Mm -hmm. um, and then what you might want to tweak if you don't have the money for, for a resume writer, sure. um, that would be, I think, a great one. But that that's where most of mine came from. Mm -hmm. And then also I was teaching at the same university as Matthew um, in the PACE program. So we're working with a lot of international students, almost all of them with master's degrees and a lot mm -hmm. of them with 15 years of work experience who were incredible people um, and needed like am amazing resume. So, in the in the free programs mm -hmm. how is that how is that hurting a newcomer yeah i mean i think it's certainly worth exploring right i mean newcomers come in with a range of of pressures financial ones you know uh, urgency to work things like that and so it, it doesn't hurt to start there um but keep in mind that yeah i mean they are pumping out a lot of they're pumping a lot of people through their system um in a short amount of time right and so if you're looking for that in-depth you know personalized service um i i don't know if it's always going to be there um there's there's certainly a, a numbers aspect to it. Um, okay. The other side of it is it was a great place for me to start my career and, and learn all about career development and start implementing the theories, the practices and things like that. Um, but now that I've been in it and doing it for a long time, I feel like I've gotten much better and, and could probably offer um, a slightly, you know, elevated, more personalized service that way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's that's some of the, the two big differences, I think, is the numbers and then just in terms of how long people have been doing it. Um, yeah. Right, okay. So a new, like, and I guess if they're staying, the, the person who's doing it for you, mm -hmm. if they're staying on top, of because I, I know yeah. some people who they're like, I've been writing resumes for 20 years. And then I look and I'm like, oh, but you haven't updated your style of resume. Right, in yeah. 20 years, right? Yeah, I don't. We're not painting in broad strokes here, right? It's yes. it's very no, sort of, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, yeah, when I when I was first starting out there, I mean, I, like if I look back at some of those first clients that I was supporting versus the ones that I was supporting in year four, they were definitely getting a, a, a different level of service, right? Yes. Um, and so now, if somebody's you know tried that and maybe it's not working, then maybe if we look at somebody, you know, one of the private ones who's been doing this for seven, eight, ten years you're gonna end up getting what you pay for. Okay, okay. Um, and if a person, because resume writers are expensive, if mm -hmm. a person is doesn't love their career center resume, mm. do you send them anywhere? Like any other affordable 
like our hmm. tips or do you have any tips on that kind of thing? Um, if they don't love what they got from the free service, mm -hmm. that is that sort of it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would encourage people to to shop around and, and find a coach that that works with them and their style. I mean, certainly asking for samples of work and testimonials and reviewing that, like the coach's background. I mean, you know, I would shop around for other professional services and I, I would advise newcomers to do the same. I mean, we, you and I have talked a lot about it. We, we have very different styles, but ultimately our goals are very aligned. And so, uh, you know, what works for, for my clients might not work for yours and vice versa. Yeah. Do you give samples if someone asks you for a sample resume? I'm very reluctant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Cause I'll be like, Oh yeah, make sure you ask for samples. I'm like, Oh, I don't give them. Yeah. Um, because, because I once had somebody take um, a, a resume sample of mine and then use it, but they didn't change a part. Like they didn't change um, a, like a number and like that was on my sample and they ended up mm -hmm. someone, I can't remember how the story went. Somehow someone called, like ended up calling the number, but it was my number to be a reference. Oh, nice. <laughs> but it's cause I put that number um, into the fake resume. Anyhow. Yeah. Then I got really reluctant about it. Okay. Yeah, um, there's too much temptation there. And and even when people are um, like asking for resume templates and things like that, yeah. um, design templates, I I show it, but I always add the caveat of, you know, like just take inspiration and go out and create your own. There's no more satisfying sort of process. And at the when you get to the end of it and you say, I did this. Um, yes. That's pretty satisfying. It's not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I am. I'm reluctant. So I think anybody who's on here who's like, and we'll get to questions um, right away. Resumes are one of those things that I would say if you are if you know, it's holding you back, and you know, you'll know what everyone knows it's holding you back because you're not getting interviews, or you show up for an interview, and they immediately look at you. Um, they look at you like, Hmm. disappoint yeah like <laughs> you don't quite met like it's something like your resume sets you up with something and when you show up you don't look as that same thing i think that some people think it's an interview problem i'm like that's a resume problem right mm -hmm. if you if on paper you sound like something but you show up and you seem completely different mm -hmm. um so first tip is say like save your pennies and hire a resume writer because it's probably going to make a difference but go to somebody who someone else is as good as well because uh, there's lots of not so great people and Matthew would be someone that you could absolutely trust to do that okay um so we have one question and the person is just saying how do you the first question mm -hmm. and you'll you'll love this one how do you build your work experience in your field as a newcomer how do you build great. it yeah, yeah. So I had uh, I had to do this. I mean, I spent a year um, rebuilding my whole career, and so it was. It was I, on the one hand, I think you need a two. Oh, sorry, I, need, I think you need a two pronged approach. Number one, definitely focus on your career, like your long term career goals and the 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 jobs that will take you down that path. At the same time, you you've, you've got to be realistic about time frames and and sort of cash flows and things like that and so um, I was applying for jobs that I that I wanted and wanted to turn into a career in sort of the education space adult education space but at the same time like I had bills to pay and responsibilities at home so I was working those part-time term contract positions um, in between um, okay. Yeah, it was it was a two pronged approach for me. Uh, the benefits of those is like, you know, getting getting working, you're going to be growing your network, which was key for me. Um, you're going to be learning the workplace culture, learning just the, the systems of work and things like that. Um, and there's nothing that, you know, keeps you tied down to those jobs for too long when the real career opportunities come up, um, then you go after them. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I feel like that, like, even if you're new and going to school, do you mm -hmm. think people should be working at the same time? Um, personally, I do. I think um, I'm not. I mean, that's how I got through school. And so it worked for me. Um, yeah. I, I don't I know lots of people will focus on school and school alone. Um, I just think if you wait until you graduate, until you start that job search, you're just going to you're prolonging the whole process. Um, and so getting your foot in the door early, getting your name out there um, early, you know, sets you up for positive things when, when graduation rolls around. You've, you've got a name out there already. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, have you ever gone to school just as a student, like not working? When I when I first got back to Canada, I had three like I had completed most of my degree um, via distance. Um, yeah. But when I got I had one course, I had three credit hours um, that I couldn't take online. And so when I got back to Canada, um, I, I sat in that class for a semester and I didn't worry about working. Um, but <laughs> that was when I was actually sitting in the lobby of the nonprofit where I ended up working. <laughs> I was going to that nonprofit because my wife, who was a newcomer, was attending classes there. And I sat in the lobby for three weeks just getting to know people. And, and they're like, what are you doing here? Like, you're obviously not here for classes. But I, I was studying and accompanying her and, uh, yeah, leverage that into a job offer. <laughs> So if you're if you're gonna take away one tip, go sit in the lobby of the company you want to work at. <laughs> um, I know somebody who landed a job that way too, though. Oh, so no maybe <laughs> the lobby. Uh, but a guy who wanted to work in theater, um, oh, no. and so like wanted to work in theater. So he showed up. He'd hang around the theater. He was like, "Can I carry?" Like he offered to carry garbage. He offered to carry set pieces, and he just like volunteer that, that everyone started to know him. And then eventually like they just trusted him and would get small grants for jobs. And then he became the artistic director's assistant. Mm. And then he wrote a play and won a governor general's award. Oh, no way. Like went like, fr like, cause he, he was, I think he wanted to be a doctor or something. And then, but fell in love with theater schlep 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 got this yeah. term got this term and then but it, he knew it was the thing that he wanted to be in so he nice. just he just stayed right yeah. um yeah and i don't know that's a that's a wild story but yeah so sitting I in the lobby <laughs> maybe it works who knows <laughs> the lobby I mean, method yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> our new book <laughs> nice. i love it okay um yeah so i, I mean like I was going to just add to that when it when it like when you don't have experience, I know I know that's a hard one. Um, but I think for me, whenever I'm I'm talking with newcomer clients, it's about sort of reframing what I what employers mean by experience, right? It's okay. it's not about it's not about having worked on Canadian soil or paid Canadian taxes and and those kind of things. It's most of the time, like nine out, nine out of ten times, I think it's it's the soft skills piece. It's do yeah. you understand the workplace culture and the the communication styles and those kind of things. And so when when people get you know feedback from their interviews saying, you know, you don't have Canadian experience or something, and mm -hmm. I, I just that grinds my gears a little bit because uh, it's it's. I don't know. It just it just bothers me. Um, yeah. But for the newcomers that are listening, I, like most employers think that you know it's, it's usually a soft a soft skills thing as opposed to having worked in Canada. Yeah, um, I found that was the the biggest difference in when I was teaching resume writing because I teach. I think it's probably where we're different where I'm like, we're, we're, I go soft mm -hmm. and I go like tell stories mm -hmm. and I'm working with project managers who are like. No, like, no, I was an electrical engineer <laughs> and I did this, like, that they were like creating new kinds of plastic, right? Like they right. were doing wild things. And I was like, but tell me like how you explained how this plastic was good, right? Like I want to know the story behind it. And I think mm -hmm. that that's often the experience that, that Canadian companies are looking for is yeah. that they're, they don't just care about, um, how like, or you know, they don't really care what you did in the job, but they care about how the person did it, mm -hmm. right? And you have to be able to to explain how you did it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have, like, if if you haven't done that in a Canadian environment, a part time job should probably fix that for you. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Like I, I know when I'm reviewing resumes or talking with clients, like the how and the why are, yeah. are some of the most important questions. Most most newcomers are okay with the what, like what I did on the yes. job, but the how and the why are often yeah. the, the missing pieces there. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, what do I? So I have someone who says, so this is a student. He's saying, uh, as a student, I'll finish my program in network security in December 2020. Mm -hmm. that soon is it better to stay and finish my school or start a related good job 
Uh, I'm going to vote uh, start a related good job. Um, as long as you're not dropping out of school. <laughs> yeah, don't drop out of school. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, absolutely. If you can handle both, um, by the end of, by the time you graduate, you're just setting yourself up for success. Yeah. Okay. I am, I'm in absolute agreement with that. Um, someone else is saying, um, what are they saying? Means not, maybe it's related to something else that I'm not seeing, but I'm, I'll just read what I see, which okay. is means not searching or applying are applying for a job, looking for completely, looking for a completely related to my major job. And if I want to work in volunteer IT, what should I do? I don't know how to answer that. I, it sounds like, um, I feel like there's something missing in the question that I don't understand. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> what, was the what, was the last, what was the last piece about volunteering? It just said, like, so it says means not searching or applying for jobs. So maybe something else yeah. was like that they can't apply. So they're looking for something related to their major. Mm. Um, should they work a volunteer IT job? What should I do? Mm. Yeah, I mean, if, if you can find any type of opportunities, I, like usually I, I talk about employment and education and volunteer as great ways to, to gain those experiences. Um, IT can sometimes, I think, be a little bit tricky in terms of volunteering just because you have access to, you know, uh, secure data and files and things like that. And companies might not always be open to it. Um, but there are there are opportunities I've seen in the past, whether it's at a nonprofit or a school, university, something like that, where you're maybe all you have to do is set up an, a new computer lab or network a new computer lab and they're, they're looking for people to do that um, so I, I have also known of some uh, I'll have to get the name Isaka I want to say it's like a cyber security um, volunteer site um, I don't I'll, I'll have to look up the acronym for that one maybe I'll post it in the comments later but uh, yeah. okay um, I see I see that was a continuation of the student question. So I see it now. <laughs> yeah, that gotcha. it was the two together. Okay. Um, I would say, like, I went to a thing called uh, Data Science Go, which was all right. these data scientists, like, mostly like Silicon Valley people nice. um, when you could travel. And the biggest thing that they said that was related, like, I feel related to that question is that um, they absolutely looked for side projects. That especially in IT, like especially IT and anything that's kind of tech, if mm -hmm. you can do anything, even if you can't get a job, running your own network security program or trying a trial, like even doing it for a not for profit, finding a way to do it mm -hmm. is going to look better than you just being in school. Cause like, cause some, I just feel like some of the programs that newcomers are going into to check that mark for education are graduating so many people with no work experience. So if you don't have a volunteer project, I don't know how you set, I don't know how you how you can set yourself apart from anyone else. Yeah, no, that's that's solid advice. And um, you know, I know there's the on like the online community or the tech community is already online. And so there's lots of hubs and meetups and and forums that you can be a part of. And, and those might be good places to get connected with uh, with other professionals, as well as um, I know like in, in Winnipeg, anyways, we've got um, organizations that are specific volunteer matching organizations. So right. you know, reach, reaching out to them and saying, hey, this is what I can do. If you ever have anybody who's looking for this, you know, give me a call. And, and it might not be right away, but it, at least you've got a, another sort of stake in the fire. Yeah. And I think, um, so sometimes I feel like, I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is, um, sometimes I get the impression that there's a belief that if you were born in Canada, when you go to school, go to university, that you just get the job. But it's mm -hmm. like most people who go to university also volunteer or have a job on the side too, no matter if they are brand new here or they've always been here. It's Absolutely. like, yeah. So I think that it's something that like it's a hoop that every everybody jumps. So I worked lots of part time jobs as I went to university and it was actually all of that working that made a difference in my career. Right. Absolutely. I can remember when I when I was like leaving high school, I told my parents, like my parents were like, what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, I'll go to university. And they said, great. How are you going to pay for it? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, 
<laughs> I guess I'm getting a job. Like, I'm there working. we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like that's, that's how I did it really. Yeah. And really slowly. Right. I had the yeah, yeah. full-time job at a theater and then I just went to university when it kind of worked with our schedule. Right. So it took yeah. a long time. Um, somebody has a question. They're saying, how can they highlight their career profile to the field they want to go to, but they don't have, but, uh, but they don't have related work experience on their career path. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So this is pretty common, I think with, with, uh, with young professionals and students, um, or even people that are changing careers. Um, so definitely like in my approach anyways, I, I'd want to align people's profiles with the job they're applying for. So we do the same process of analyzing job postings and, and identifying the key skills. Um, and then we look at what's next. So if you don't have directly related work experience, which I feel is, you know, the, the probably like option A, then we would just go down a list of two in terms of maybe you've got education or training experience that you can bring in. Um, you know, you've worked on lab assignments or projects, presentations with your classmates, like that's the next best thing. Um, and if we don't have that, then we can go on to volunteering. And if we don't have that, we can go on to, you know, um, non-related work experience and maybe some transferable skills. So it's it's kind of a hierarchy, I guess we, we would work through in that. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, I have a question. Sure. What do you do about, so you um, in your situation, you were in Asia for 10 years, you came back and everybody knew, but they may not know where you had worked, but they knew the word, but they could say your name, Matthew. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, and there's been lots of studies where if you have a name that is maybe difficult for, um, I'm just like, I want to say like average Canadian because that's not proper language, but like mm -hmm. somebody who is not used to saying anything more complicated than like Sheila um, and you're applying for jobs and you know that your name might be difficult. Do you give any advice to students on how how they can make it easier for someone or you don't like do you have what conversation do you have around yeah. that? Yeah, great question because it, it does come up a lot. Um, so I am not I'm not one who, like I don't um, suggest or advise people Canadianizing their names. I've yeah. seen the studies, I, I've read the reports, and I just yeah I, I can't in good faith I can't recommend that. Yes. Um, that said, like if if somebody you know genuinely wants to be called um, Steve instead of so young or, or whatever it might be yeah. um and that's what you're going to be called at work and that's what you want your colleagues to call you or, or whatever then then go for it yeah. um what's your what's your take on it oh man i <laughs> i am like this is the bad like i think having a name that no one in canada like that is not popular mm -hmm. sets you up because think about like how many like how many matthews are there Oof. right like <laughs> like there's too many right yeah, like yeah. even even typing it i think i called you like matthew price like some but some other matthew like uh i'm married to a dave like it's very hard as a dave or a matthew or a mike to be mm -hmm. known but if you're no like if you have a name that is really uncommon you can own that name and you can brand that name like so, twig. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. like twig. Like so, you can. T I think you can take your name and go. Okay, people don't know how to. They don't know how to pronounce it. So I think the first thing is to is to go. Okay, if egos are a thing, so if I'm mm. applying for a job, and they're not going to call me because they don't know how to say my name, which is a real thing, right? Mm. There's HR people who don't know how to say a name, and it's disgusting. It's disgusting to hear and and. I think it would anger me if it happened to me, mm -hmm. but if they don't know how to say it, they may not call you. So what could you do on your resume to make it easier? And I would just say like, do the phonetic thing, mm -hmm. right? So um, um, did you ever work with a guy at a uh, university named uh, Chinmi? No. So Chinmi, um, can't remember where he's from, but Chinmi okay. would say like, hey, yeah, I'm Chinmi. And he would go, I'm Chinmi. Hmm. Like he would touch his chin yeah. and he would point to himself and you remembered his name. Whereas if he were, if he said, you know, like chin me and didn't give me anything, it might've mm -hmm. taken me a couple of weeks to latch on. So I think 
One is if, if you're the kind of person who can make it fun and easy, do it because it's going to immediately make set the other person at ease and make you likable. And likability is a huge thing in hiring. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So pretending that it's not feels ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. So I think if you can set the other person at ease. And then the other one, it, like, as I kind of go, then go on, like, go on a place on LinkedIn and use your name and just make smart comments mm -hmm. on other people's posts, post stories of your own, like, post pictures of yourself and post um, content about yourself and brand yourself so that when they see that unusual name, they'll see, like, unusual to us name. Mm -hmm they'll see it over and over again. And then when they see it on a resume, they'll be like, oh, that's that person from LinkedIn. And it's yeah. a beautiful branding exercise. Well, it's a good positive association, right? Like they've already got yes. positive feelings and any re and reactions and emotions to to stuff they put out on LinkedIn or wherever it might be. And so um, that that intimidation that they might feel like, okay, I've got to, I've got to say this, um, well, hopefully will be reduced. And I, I think, yeah, I, I don't know if, I don't know if I've done the phonetic thing on a resume or cover letter. I've done for some people who who genuinely have um, a, an English name. Um, we've I've done that before. Put it in brackets. Um, but I, yeah. but in the, if you're applying online, like in an email, I think that's a great place to to sort of tone down the the level of formality and say, hey, here's my name. You know, this is how you'd say it. Like, give me a call. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. we like, yeah, because people we just don't know. Right. Yeah. And so anything that breaks that barrier, like I just feel like calling out the thing that might be stopping you. Mm -hmm. And if it's as silly as your name and I'm with you, like um, I've had students who they're like, my name is like Mike or something. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I'm just like, uh, and then they're and then other people are calling him another name. And I just ask them about it. And I just go like, I can't imagine having to change it. I don't think you need to. No. I think everyone else needs to get better at just saying words that we aren't used to saying. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's no, and there's no shame also. Um, I would also say in, if you come from a place where you're going to say a couple of English words wrong and maybe at an interview, mm -hmm. I just go like, I couldn't yeah. say more than three words, like in a lot of things. So there's no, like no shame. Right. Don't let None that hold you back. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Somebody is asking this question. We'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, it's from LinkedIn. So okay. it says um, places that are worth referring the newcomers to are the consulates of their countries of origin in the cities that they live in. Because some of them offer different social initiatives that support the community in different areas. <laughs> career development is one of them. Mm -hmm. So they're saying that uh, the Columbia Consulate in Toronto offers mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff throughout the year. Mm hmm. Uh, so what's the question part? Like, do I know? Any I don't other think cases? I think I guess they're just I think maybe this is someone saying this is this is a comment that they know. Yeah. yeah, I think like I think whenever whenever you're um, getting career advice from like a big place, <laughs> so a, like a university, a corporation, um, you know, a community program, a consulate, just make sure that like, see if you can get a second opinion on your resume, because not everybody who get like, in resume writing, here's the truth on like the dark side of resume writing, the people who make money at resume writing are the ones who are usually working for themselves. And the people who don't get a lot of money for doing resume writings have jobs as resume writers. And it's not a great paying job as like, as an employee. Is that, would you say that that's true? Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I agree with a lot of that. I think like, um, obviously governments have a, have an interest in supporting newcomers that come into the country. And so they provide these services free of charge, right? They want yeah. to give, they want to give a, a leg up, a step up, a, a hand to, to, to integrate into the society as quickly as possible. And so yeah. they definitely offer those services, but <clears throat> you're saying, you're right. There's, there's so many other issues that a, that a, a, a private career coach or, or resume writer maybe wouldn't encounter. Right. So whether there's funding challenges or staffing challenges, um, 
training challenges, all of those challenges that get associated with large organizations, um, private, you know, resume writers who have been doing this for a long time wouldn't wouldn't face, and they tend to so then they focus on their craft and and the quality usually goes yeah. way up. So. Yeah, yeah, I know this wonderful resume writer in um, in Edmonton. Um, she works mostly with youth, but like she works for a non for profit, and she's and she's like, I just like, I think some people step away because she just wants to give more attention, and she can't like within that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like if you're going, I think if you're going to go to those places, just make sure that you get us like get a second opinion on it. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Um, so someone is asking, they're saying they're listening from the US. Do they think that what we're saying is universal? I would I would think so. I don't think anything we've really mentioned here has been has pertained, you know, strictly to the Canadian market. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't think there's anything too, too different. I mean, you, you work with more US clients than than I would, but uh, yeah, I'm almost all US. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah very. No one in Canada will. <laughs> they, they, they're not, they don't like my US rates. <laughs> um, that's fine. Um, but yeah, in, in, in the US, I very few of the people that I work with in the US. Would I uh, would be you come like would be would be newcomers like mm. been new to the U.S. in the last like three years? Mo right. Like if they if they came from a non-U.S. place, it was like fifteen years ago, right? So they're all like yeah, they're already it's integrated. not as much. Sure. Yeah, they already know. Um, how do you show soft skills if your current position doesn't highlight them? If my current position doesn't highlight them, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. So if my, so if my if current... you, yeah. So if you have soft skills, but your current job doesn't allow you to show those soft skills, how might you okay. show, how would you show that you have them? Um, I think I'd probably have a conversation with that person. Cause I think, uh, I don't know many jobs out there that, that don't require soft skills or that don't, uh, don't have some level of interpersonal communication skills involved in them. Right. Unless, yeah. I mean, unless you're you're digging holes in the middle of them, you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah, but even that's time management. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Status updates, you know? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, no, I mean, I, I would probably coach the person and say, look, like, there's got to be some way we can we can articulate, we can we can uh, capture that because um, whether whether it's interpersonal, face to face, or online, or or somehow, I mean, if you work with other people, there's got to be interpersonal skills there. Um, yeah. And if if it's not this particular job, then maybe we we look at past experiences or, or other, um, you know, instances of social interaction. I mean, I know if you have the skills, then we just focus on the times and places where you've demonstrated those. Right. Okay. Um, two or three page resume. Oh, are we going to have this conversation, Carrie? <laughs> Do it quick. Do it quick. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely like one to twos are fine. Three in extreme cases, but not often. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't really like. I think the least interest, like the least interesting question to ask someone who's worked with resumes is how long it should be. It's always we're all all good ones. We'll say it depends. Yeah. Um. I teach I teach a one page networking resume when you know somebody. I teach a three page resume with if you're working in IT or like a senior position, right? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Then I do that. Yeah. Cool. Anything um, I'll say anything that's on your third page is not going to make or break your application, anyways, right? Like right. any anything of value is going to be on the front. So yeah, how do you know if a resume and cover letter is good enough? Oh, I see. I had this in my notes here. <laughs> <'Cause>, uh, <laughs> You're that like, was, someone will ask this. Yeah, yeah how do you know? Someone will ask it. Well, I think it's one of the conversations that comes up with with a lot of times when I'm working with, with a newcomer client is, you know, um, we have to do better than good enough is, is sort of the feedback I give. Because lots of times I'll, I'll you know, I'll get a resume and, and they'll say, well, this is good enough. And it's like, mm, no, no, we've got to push for more here. Um, so when is a resume good enough or better than good enough? For me is when it tells a personal story when it keeps me engaged and interested throughout, when it doesn't sound like a job posting, right? Yes. When it, 
when it when it adds flavor and flair and and when you when you contextualize your experiences um, so that it only could be from you and that it could only be um, you know from lived experience that's that's when it's better than good enough you sound like me look at you you're being very <laughs> romantic about resumes <laughs> I have a side Carrie I have yeah a side. I know um, so how do you help someone? So I think one thing that I find uh, with anybody, right? Like newcomer, non-newcomer is that on the resume, they know, like, so they hear you say that and they say, mm -hmm. you have to be human. You have to send out, <clears throat> but they're so scared about looking perfect and not letting like just the skills be, they're scared of telling a story or not mm -hmm. putting everything in it. How do you help people just to trust to trust mm -hmm. that what they put there is enough and that showing some personality is a safe choice. Yeah. So I guess I remove the resume writing element from it and just start with, with a conversation, right? Like tell me about a time you did this oh. and let's just, let's just talk about it and, and don't yeah. worry about the writing. Don't worry about the resume right now. And, but as they're talking, I, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, asking the right questions and sort of eliciting oh. the ideas. Um, and mentally I'm taking notes or if, if we're on a zoom call or something, I'm, I'm, I'm typing them out. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, when they're done, I'll say, okay, this is what I heard you say and relay those skills and those characteristics, those qualities back to them. And they're like, Whoa, I didn't, I didn't even know, you know, I didn't even know I, I did yeah. that or I said that. And so, yeah, remove, remove, I know you do this too, like remove the, the resume writing piece from it. Cause that's intimidating. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, like, I think it's hard. Cause I'm like, you only get that with a coach. Like you mm -hmm. only get that with a resume writer. And maybe that's the difference, right? It was between um, like a great resume writer will have that conversation with you, will help you mm -hmm. be seen and then help you pull out what's worth, what's worth sharing. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm like, rare, rarely is, right? Is yeah. there any, is there anything else Cause we've talked like usually these talks i i do i try not to make it happen but everyone always asks about resume how important is their resume if like uh, a, a job search is a hundred percent okay how important is a resume in there um <laughs> i think i understand the question yeah <laughs> yeah like if, if there's all the parts, so there's like, there's networking and there's LinkedIn mm. and there's your, like your reputation mm -hmm. and there's the interview, okay. what, how, like almost every career conversation ends mm -hmm. up being about the resume and how important is it overall in helping sure. someone to land a job? I'll say 20%. Nice. David <laughs> Hamilton. Yeah. Just worded it for me. He yeah. said, if resumes, networking, job searching, cover letters were pieces of a pie, yes. how would you divide up that pie? Okay. That's an even better question. Yes. So Tell me about that pie. <laughs> um, yeah, so absolutely, like networking is going to be 50 to 60% of that, right? Um, you know, companies, hiring managers, they're looking for people. They, they, they want the right person to fit their team. Um, Yes, you need a resume to get through that process, but it is one of many requirements, right? It's not going to be the, the be all and end all. Um, and I know for a lot of us, I mean, we all know people who have gotten jobs without resumes or it's purely a formality, right? Like submit the resume, we'll get it, but we'll talk later kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so yes, absolutely essential to to have, but it's, it's, it's not the main piece of the puzzle. Um, networking, growing your reputation, your credibility, whether that's on LinkedIn or through personal contact, um, you know, connecting with industries, contributing to the field. Um, I think employers want to see that you're, that you're involved and that you're making positive contributions. Um, if you can do all that, then yeah, they'll 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 take your resume and and just double check to make sure it all checks out. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Do most of your clients land jobs because of their resumes or because of networking? Like, how are your clients landing? Yeah, it's it's mostly networking. Um, again, resumes are a piece of the puzzle, and um, but I would say the the bulk of the job search strategy is is absolutely in person networking, referrals, LinkedIn. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Right yeah. now. So in co someone is asking about like COVID-19. So in COVID-19 times mm -hmm. of all my clients that have landed mm -hmm. in the last couple of weeks, none of them landed with a resume. Mm. Nice. None of them. Like, um, and I think in three cases, they didn't even like nowhere, like we, ha they had a resume ready mm -hmm. and the process of writing the resume helped them to know what they were good at, but they didn't like, they didn't need the resume. Right. No. Um, and I think what happens, what I think happens is that people get told resumes are the most important thing and they get obsessed mm -hmm. with them and like how many pages and what the words are. And if you spend all your time there, um, I think it's going to be a longer search mm -hmm. where if you know what you're good at and model that so that you're branding. And if you mm -hmm. have, I, you know, a great name, <laughs> use it. <laughs> and like, I just see things happening way better that way. Right. Absolutely. My, I can, from personal experience, um, the last five years, I'd say once I sort of, I, I spent four years sort of building a name and building credibility, but the last four or five years, things have been, just bonkers um and and really it's been way more opportunity with way fewer resumes and and less job search it's just yes. just being out there just being, yes. being yourself yeah absolutely cool um okay i'm gonna ask you kind of one more question sure um and i'm sorry it's this question but they're asking it okay <laughs> is a cover letter as equally important as a resume <laughs> um <laughs> Okay, um, I'm gonna say uh, my approach is always yes, have a cover letter with every application. Um, you can't decide or you won't know whether an employer is gonna read it or not. So either it's gonna be a net zero uh, or it's gonna be a positive, right? It's never gonna hurt your chances. So a little bit of extra work, but you know, it's worth it. It's worth it, yeah. yeah. Um, and then where can people find you if they wanna get, if they're like, listen to you right now and they're like, hey, <laughs> I want to hire this guy. How yeah. can they, how can they, where do they find you? Where's a good place? Where do you hang out? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I'm on LinkedIn daily. So that would be the best place to, uh, to connect. Um, and then websites coming soon. So okay. I'll be online soon. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And what kind of people, like, where do you have an ideal person that you work really kind of great with that I should yeah. send your way? Who's, who's great for you? Yeah, so I work with a lot of uh, a lot of young and mid professionals, like uh, sort of young professionals who are starting their career, as well as uh, mid career professionals, um, sort of with that uh, five to fifteen years of experience, and a lot of work with newcomers. And uh, yeah, nice, I love Connect. it. Yeah, cool. Anything else you want to go? You want to share before you go? No, just thank you for having me, and uh, yeah. I love what you're doing here with the career stories. I've caught a couple of them, and so just happy to to be a part and and uh, enjoy the conversation. Yes, awesome, cool. Well, I'll see yeah. you around. I'm excited to see you in the flesh when we're allowed to go out again. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, cool. All right. Okay, take care. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk to you later. Okay, bye. Um, yeah. So that was so nice that you come here. I'm seeing one other question that I think I'm just going to ask. And then, um, and then I'm going to sign off. But one uh, question that Daniel is asking, he's asking um, if we have any networking suggestions for newcomers. Um, that usually your circles are smaller, because like uh, so, so usually circles are smaller having arrived recently. So what I would say, if you are a newcomer, so usually you'll get in 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 my experience of which is like which is limited. Um, you'll be introduced to communities, right? And often, um, it, often there's, there's services. So go to all, like, go to all of those places that the government welcomes you to, that the different um, social programs welcome you to, like go out and do that, but then figure out if you know what sector you want to work in, go and find, I would say all those people are initially probably are going to be on LinkedIn. And at first, you don't want to reach out and introduce yourself, but just even just follow them on LinkedIn, figure out what words they're using, what are they talking about, what opportunities do they have, um, what words are they using, so that you get a feel for like how people are even interacting. 
If there's any um, industry magazines, if there's any local associations, reach out to those groups before you reach out to the companies and then look for look for um, events like I. So I'm not not a newcomer, but when I was switching from working in the art, I worked in the arts and then I moved into HR. And the first thing that I did is just start to go to general HR events. So I found HR conferences. I went to, um, got a student membership, like as an HR person and would go to these, and would go to these, um, events and just introduce myself, like really as an emerging student. And I think so often people think when they're networking that you have to make yourself bigger than you are. It's totally okay to say like, I'm new here and I'm just starting. And sometimes that like just being honest about where you're at is going to go a lot further than you trying to be perfect or trying to make yourself look bigger than you are. Right. So grounded in reality. And then after you've established that, then you can be strategic about the companies that you can reach out and talk to. I think LinkedIn is this is one of the safest safest places because you're looking for somebody who's creating content. And if you like their content and then add a smart conversation, like smart comment or ask a question or engage with them authentically and you do that over time, they're going to know your name and it's going to build trust. And that's what you're looking like. Networking is not a quick, <laughs> you meet one person, something happens. It's multiple touch points. So that's what I would say for, for beginner advice. Yeah. So, you know, and like connect and talk to, to <laughs> like career coaches are also great people to talk to on LinkedIn because we're always just ha we're, we're like the middle people. So we know, we know the people who are looking for jobs and making career decisions. And we know the people who are making career decisions and giving people jobs and employing people. And we're kind of the middle people. So we can, we're not always going to hook you up with a job. Um, but commenting on our stuff, you're going to see a lot of different personalities too. That works. Yeah. But Matthew is a fantastic coach. And if you are looking for resume support, if you are looking, especially if you're a newcomer and you're looking for someone who knows how to navigate that system. Um, and if you have, I think he said like 15 years and under of work experience would be a fantastic person to go. So go hire him. Um, absolutely use the free services that are available. If they're not, like if they're not working for you, it's not that there's like rotten people there. Uh, if they're not working for you, it just might mean that you need a little bit more attention. Um, and then a coach like Matthew would be a great choice. So I hope that this was useful information for you. Um, look forward to continuing the conversation and other threads at other times. All right. Thanks for joining me tonight and have a good one. All right. Bye.